Now on ITV, it's the news at 10. A heartfelt tribute and the most solemn of vows, the new king's first address to the nation. As the queen herself did with such unswerving devotion, I too now solemnly pledge myself throughout the remaining time God grants me to uphold the constitutional principles at the heart of our nation. To my darling Mama, as you begin your last great journey to join my dear late Papa, I want simply to say this, thank you. Earlier, there was a kiss for a king, an affectionate outpouring as he arrived at Buckingham Palace, an unforgettable moment for his new subjects. What was it like to kiss a king? Oh, my God! Oh, oh I need to <laughs> It was a deeply moving speech. King Charles also spelt out clearly his life and role will now change. And a special announcement for William and Kate. They become the new prince and princess of Wales. Kate, the first to use the title, since Princess Diana. In this hour-long special, News at 10 will take you through all the key moments of the day as a nation not only mourns, but tries to adjust to a new reality. The new head of state meets the new prime minister and the House of Commons pays its tributes to the Queen. She was the rock on which modern Britain was built. She was a remarkable person, a remarkable monarch, and we are the poorer for her going. Queen of the world, heads of state around the globe, remember and honour. To you, she was your queen. To us, she was the queen. And as Balmoral prepares to say farewell, memories nearby of a monarch they took to their hearts. Well, we just thought she was our neighbour. Um, when she came into town, the buzz got around, she was in town, maybe doing a bit of shopping. People just left her to get on with it. This is ITV News at 10 with Julie Edgingham. Good evening. In the great shift of history caused by the death of one monarch and the new reign of another, it is easy to forget there is a family hurting, grieving at the heart of it all. The new King Charles reminded us of that as he talked of his darling mama in his first address as monarch. He thanked her for her love and devotion to their family. He said he too would endeavour to serve the country with loyalty, respect and love. He confirmed William would succeed him as Prince of Wales and spelled out that Kate will become the new Princess of Wales. Harry and Meghan remain loved too, he said. Earlier at Buckingham Palace, where even on a Friday night people are making their own connection with this moment in history, he set about embracing his new role. In return, he was embraced, kissed even, by people offering a mix of sympathy and support. The new king returns to his capital. Stepping off the flight south from Aberdeen, accompanied by his Queen Consort. The Royal Standard now flying for him in the Sovereign's motorcade for the drive into central London. In deep mourning, it is less than 24 hours since the death of his beloved mother. But the demands of public and constitutional duties make no provision for compassionate leave. Above his new home, the royal standard is raised for his arrival, a flag that is never flown at half-mast. The constitution demands that while the queen may be dead, the king lives. And the king made an immediate statement of what his monarchy will look like. There was no hesitation but to step from the car and greet the tens of thousands waiting outside the palace. From day one, he wants openness and approachability. The faces of most who wanted to shake his hand, even to kiss his hand, showed deep sympathy for King Charles the man. Sorry for your loss, they told him. 
but just by being here the crowds signalled too their acceptance that the country now has a new head of state that constitutional monarchy goes on For almost 10 minutes, he shook hands and accepted flowers and kind words. The oldest monarch ever to ascend the throne. There need be few worries, he has the energy for the job. Joined by his wife, the king and queen viewed the hundreds of bouquets of flowers, many bearing very personal tributes to his mother, that already adorned the railings in front of Buckingham Palace. And then, to the faint echoes of a bugle sounding inside, the royal couple walked through the gates to take possession of their new home. While the constitution demands continuity, the well-planned, well-rehearsed displays of respect and mourning for a departed monarch have begun to play out. The bells tolling for Her Majesty at St Paul's and at Westminster Abbey. And at cathedrals and churches here in Rochester, Kent, across the land. <laughs> Followed an hour later by a royal gun salute by the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery. 96 rounds, one for each year of the Queen's life. At the Tower of London. Hyde Park, Edinburgh Castle, Cardiff Castle, Hillsborough Castle in Northern Ireland, and from His Majesty's naval base, Gibraltar. In the House of Commons, before a day given entirely to tributes to the Queen, their own mark of respect and of memory. Order, order. I invite the House to rise and observe a minute's silence in memory of her late Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II. But the business of government must go on, and just three days after an audience with one monarch, Prime Minister Liz Truss was driven to the palace for an audience with a second. Your Majesty. Tomorrow morning, Charles will officially be proclaimed king by the Accession Council at St James's Palace. And only after that will he hold an audience with the entire cabinet. Such are the procedures and protocols that have lain unused for seven decades. Tonight, the King gave his first address to the country, speaking both for the nation and for himself about his late mother. I speak to you today with feelings of profound sorrow. Throughout her life, Her Majesty the Queen, my beloved mother, was an inspiration, an example to me and to all my family. And we owe her the most heartfelt debt any family could owe to their mother for her love, affection, guidance, understanding, and example. Queen Elizabeth was a life well lived, a promise with destiny kept, and she is mourned most deeply in her passing. That promise of lifelong service I renew to you all today. In 1947, on her 21st birthday, she pledged in a broadcast from Cape Town to the Commonwealth to devote her life, whether it be short or long, to the service of her peoples. That was more than a promise. It was a profound personal commitment which defined her whole life. She made sacrifices for duty. Her dedication and devotion as sovereign never wavered through times of change and progress, through times of joy and celebration. 
and through times of sadness and loss. I pay tribute to my mother's memory and I honor her life of service. I know that her death brings great sadness to so many of you, and I share that sense of loss beyond measure with you all. As the Queen herself did with such unswerving devotion, I too now solemnly pledge myself throughout the remaining time God grants me to uphold the constitutional principles at the heart of our nation. And wherever you may live in the United Kingdom or in the realms and territories across the world, and whatever may be your background or beliefs, I shall endeavor to serve you with loyalty, respect, and love as I have throughout my life. As my heir, William now assumes the Scottish titles which have meant so much to me. He succeeds me as Duke of Cornwall and takes on the responsibilities for the Duchy of Cornwall, which I have undertaken for more than five decades. Today, I am proud to create him Prince of Wales, to Wissog Cymru, the country whose title I have been so greatly privileged to bear during so much of my life and duty. With Catherine beside him, our new Prince and Princess of Wales will, I know, continue to inspire and lead our national conversations, helping to bring the marginal to the centre ground where vital help can be given. I want also to express my love for Harry and Meghan as they continue to build their lives overseas. To my darling Mama, as you begin your last great journey to join my dear late Papa, I want simply to say this, thank you. Thank you for your love and devotion to our family and to the family of nations you have served so diligently all these years. May flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. At St Paul's Cathedral, a congregation of 2,000 that included senior politicians and clergy, but for the most part members of the public who had taken seats on a first-come, first-served basis Listen to the speech before the start of a service of prayer and reflection. We give thanks for a life of devotion to God, her creator, redeemer, and sustainer, and of devotion to all her people. And for the first time in an official setting, words to the national anthem that have not been sung for 70 years. The days ahead will be marked by ceremonial and solemn memorial as the Queen's body begins its journey to Holyrood House, then to lie at rest in St Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh before being brought south to lie in state at Westminster Hall. James Mason News at 10. Well, it is said to have been the Queen who invented the royal walkabout in New Zealand in 1970, as we've just seen the crowds outside Buckingham Palace were treated to one by her son and successor. King Charles reached out to them and they reached right back to him with hands and hearts. A police outrider was the crowd's first clue. Phones raised in anticipation. They caught sight 
of the King's car. Cheers and chants for the man who'd left London a son and returned here their sovereign. These were symbolic steps as King and Queen Consort making the people their priority. We're sorry, they told him. I've been dreading it, he replied. In one moment, they were both mourning and meeting a monarch. Looking at his face, it was, it looks really devastated. So he told you that he'd been dreading this day. You could really sense that. Yeah, oh, grief. yes, definitely. Oh, yeah, he, he looked really upset, didn't he? He looked, he looked really upset. When I saw him, it was like, I felt the pain. And then for him to have to be in front of all these people and, you know, hold it together, it's, it's a lot. For 73 years, they've known him as a prince. Now many in this crowd are his subjects, the first, to greet him as a king. On behind followed the Queen Consort. God bless you. God bless you. Between them, they shook hundreds of hands and even received kisses. I said, may I kiss you? He said, well, yes. What was it like to kiss a king? Oh, my God. Oh, oh I nearly fell. <laughs> you nearly fell? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm going to take that kiss forever. Never wash that cheek? No. Oh, he's lovely. Oh, I kissed you. his hand as well. You kissed his hand as well? It was impulsive. Kiss the king's hand. Then the king and queen consort followed their new path into the palace. They must walk it alone, but with a nation's support. Paul Brand, News at 10, Buckingham Palace. And uh, Chris, our royal editor, is here, who's been charting us throughout the day. And uh, I think we can go to some live shots near Buckingham Palace on the Mall this evening whilst we're chatting. So the crowds, and still they come this evening. It is a Friday night, I suppose. But um, so much for everyone to take in, and not least this speech from the new king. So much for everyone to take in. And actually, that's looking away from Buckingham Palace down towards Admiralty Arch and Trafalgar Square. And I've, literally, I've just come from there myself, actually. And people are, in a way in which they did around the time of the Platinum Jubilee celebrations, the road is closed closed right now and they're just taking a moment to be uh, and experience a moment of history obviously sad history whereas at the jubilee it was uh, much happier times but when that speech finished uh, today there was a spontaneous ripple there was no monitors up like there was for the jubilee but clearly people are watching on their phones or listening uh, on their devices and julie you know what so much to unpack uh, <laughs> in that speech i barely know uh, where to begin but in doing what he had to do today which was to reflect on his mother's life of service but also to articulate what kind of king he was going to be he hit the ball out of the park um, you know it was just like phrase after phrase of history in there I mean I, I mean I was struck by the, the the pledge to serve throughout the remaining time God grants me he says uh, we will talk later in the program about uh, announcing that William and Kate will now be known as the Prince and Princess of Wales I mean clearly a lot to say uh, uh, about that and that he will be a different kind of king so the, the, as he referred to it his charities and issues by which he means the campaigning prince he was he will not be as monarch and, and threaded throughout this incredibly warm, very moving tribute to, to his late mother in the context of her own uh, reign as queen, but also in that intimate mother-son relationship was quite something. Wasn't yes, it? and I, I think, you know, that is why um, we can probably see some more pictures of that, that walkabout now. He started his reign as he means to go on, and I think because of the personal grief that he is currently suffering, uh, that is why the crowds were there to offer him their support. Yeah, they were incredible scenes, weren't they? And, and, and we were struck by the fact that people were, I mean, tactile with him. This is a different relationship already. I, I agree with you and actually uh, some of my colleagues down at uh, Buckingham Palace they were saying oh I'm, I'm rather shocked by the people that are reaching out and touching the Queen. I wasn't because I've kind of seen crowds do that in around the country you know famously there's been some incidents in, in South London recently in very diverse areas of the capital where people have been you know reaching out kissing hugging him. I've seen it in Canada and other places so I wasn't surprised at all that somebody <laughs> in the crowd today uh, reached out and gave the King a kiss on his very first walkabout, but you could see the emotion in his eyes actually down there. Um, clearly, a very, very difficult. Well, this was less than 24 hours since the announcement. 
It is quite Sorry. an extraordinary thing to witness. OK, uh, Chris, we will talk to you again a bit later on in the programme for the moment. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that. Well, even if it wasn't quite expected yet, it was always on the cards that Prince William would become Prince of Wales, following in his father's footsteps when he was heir to the throne, as Chris was explaining. It follows, too, that Kate would become Princess of Wales. The footsteps she will be following in will be those of the mother-in-law she never knew, and the mother William can never forget. The 21st Prince of Wales drives through the streets of ancient Carnarvon for his investiture. He was the Prince of Wales at just 10 years of age, though his investiture at Carnarvon Castle was not held until 1969 when he was 21. Crowned by his mother in front of a global audience. When Charles married Diana, the two became familiar faces in Wales. In Cardiff, on her first royal visit, the new Princess of Wales ended her speech in Welsh, saying she was looking forward to returning to the country soon. Addressing the nation for the first time as king this evening, the longest-serving Prince of Wales bestowed the title on his eldest son, William. Today... I am proud to create him Prince of Wales, to Wysog Cymru, the country whose title I have been so greatly privileged to bear. In Carnarvon tonight, a cautious welcome for the new prince. We need to look forward and we need to embrace change as well, so yeah. Um, but it's interesting. He's done a lot of good things, you know, especially around the mental health stuff. Prince William has spent a lot of time in Wales, hasn't mm. he? He was at RAF Valley, so he knows the area. Yeah. Having trained and graduated as an RAF search and rescue helicopter pilot, William lived on Anglesey with his wife, the Duchess of Cornwall, after their marriage in 2011. She will now become the Princess of Wales, an extremely poignant moment for William, whose mother defined that role for so many years. So the end of the day and the end of an era in Wales, as it looks to a fresh beginning with its new Prince and Princess. Priest Williams, News at 10. Cardiff. Well, in Parliament, as tradition and genuine respect dictate, MPs stood for a minute in silence to remember the Queen. Many then shared those memories in speeches that followed. They came from all corners of the House of Commons. They came from the current Prime Minister, one Elizabeth, eulogising another. From past Prime Ministers and from the would-be Prime Minister, Sir Keir Starmer, who said the Queen had not reigned over us, she had lived alongside us. Queen Elizabeth II took her throne before any politician here in Parliament ever took their seat. Hearts off, strikers! Her death brings one of those rarest of moments when politicians, wherever they sit, order, order, stand together. Prime Ministers, former <laughs> Prime Ministers, <laughs> opposition leaders, and so many more. Liz Truss began. She was the rock on which modern Britain was built. The Queen welcomed her 15th Prime Minister just three days ago. Everyone who met her will remember the moment. They will speak of it for the rest of their lives. On that same day. She saw off her 14th Prime Minister. And I can tell you, in that audience, she was as radiant and as knowledgeable and as fascinated by politics as ever I can remember. They spoke of the Queen as a woman. Starting her reign in what was emphatically then a man's world. Yeah. And a grandmother. And for me as a grandmother myself, I know and understand the complete love that she had for her family. And they spoke of a nation's grief. We say thank you. The loss of our Queen robs this country of its stillest point its greatest comfort at precisely the time we need those things most. But in this chamber where many have met the Queen, there was also laughter, like when Theresa May remembered dropping a block of cheese on the floor during a picnic at Balmoral. I had a split-second decision to make. <laughs> I picked up the cheese, put it on the plate and put it on the table. <laughs> And I turned round to see that my every move <laughs> had been watched very carefully by Her Majesty the Queen. I looked at her 
She looked at me. <laughs> and she just smiled. I remember her innocent joy more than ten years ago after the opening ceremony of the London Olympics when I told her that the leader of a friendly Middle Eastern country seemed actually to believe that she had jumped out of a helicopter <laughs> in a pink dress and parachuted into the stadium. I recall the Queen saying what a very busy Christmas she'd had, and I suggested, well, at least her family don't need to pause Christmas lunch for the Queen's speech, at which she told me they most certainly did. <laughs> the tributes came from all parties and all nations. Whilst she was everyone's Queen, for many in Scotland, she was Elizabeth, Queen of Scots. Some brought tears. She was a remarkable person, a remarkable monarch, and we are the poorer for her going. Others, poetry. She was our north, our south, our east and west, our working week and our Sunday rest, our noon, our midnight, our talk, our song. We thought that love would last forever. We were wrong. Anushka reporting from Westminster there. And uh, Robert joins us now uh, from Downing Street. Robert, oh. I mean, the House of Commons at its best, really, today. It was an extraordinary few hours with so many wonderful tributes. But I think everybody really in Westminster and beyond just taking in the fact that we have a new head of state, a new prime minister in the space mm. of days. Yeah, I mean, look, if it's a shock to all of us that within the course of three days we got a new prime minister and a new monarch, think what it must feel like to Liz Truss, who became prime minister, moved in uh, to 10 Downing Street only on Tuesday. This was supposed to be a week in which she was explaining uh, how she was going to deploy £150 billion pounds of taxpayers' money to avoid terrible, terrible hardship for millions of people from surging energy prices. Instead, all of that has been parked for assessment for the te uh, until after the 10 days of mourning and instead she's having to form a new relationship with King Charles III. She spoke to him yesterday, she went to, she had an audience with him this afternoon uh, at which doubtless she will have expressed her condolences again and begun to uh, frankly discuss not only the logistics of the next few days but set out her big priorities. Most of that however will have to wait until the morning is over. Uh, the other thing that she obviously needs to do is to represent the nation. When she stands up and, and speaks, she did that yesterday here in uh, 10 Downing Street, did it again today in the House of Commons. I, you know, she doesn't have a track record of sort of channeling the emotions of the British people and reflecting them back in the way that, say, a Tony Blair uh, has done in the past. And uh, some would say, uh, actually, somebody who's not famous for oratory, Theresa May, did today, uh, as did, uh, some would say again, Boris Johnson and indeed Keir. Starmer. But the important thing about both Liz Truss and King Charles is they need each other. Uh, neither were particularly popular, it has to be said, compared to their uh, predecessors in many ways. The success of their relationship matters to all of us. It also matters to them very much. Indeed. Robert, thank you. Well, across the UK today, in the sunshine and in the showers, the Queen for all seasons was remembered both with smiles and tears. She was also, as we'll hear, the Queen for all ages. It had seemed until yesterday as though she was the Queen for all time too. It was a strange morning that broke across this United Kingdom. A stillness at first. The flags fluttered low. And then the day began. There were jobs to go to and deliveries to be made. But something has changed here. Something is not the same. God save our gracious Queen. At school assembly, they sang the anthem as it used to be. The lesson, someone very special has gone. The Queen. She was a really nice person. She looked after the whole entire world and I love her. She helped the world a lot and she, she's special for, for everyone. 
At midday, the bells tolled, so there was a chance to stop and think. In the streets and in the squares, a very personal sadness could be shared. It feels like losing my mum all over again. Um, I can't actually, I'm shocked at how upset I am. Um, I'm ex-military, so she was my boss. Um, and, uh, but she's always been there, um, the most amazing woman. I'm just finding it. I'm sure there's lots of other people like me. It's just this huge part of our lives that has changed. She was just so magnificent. But along with the sense of loss came gratitude. And she was my queen throughout her, throughout her reign. I had a queen that was stoic, that was so diligent to her in, in her role and her duty and she did that to the very end and of that and of her I am really proud. May her soul rest in complete peace. For those wanting to pay tribute, the places of worship were the obvious places to go to light a candle and write in the book. She was honoured too at Friday prayers. Well, as a Muslim, the first thing we say is inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, which basically means from God we came and to him we return. So uh, effectively that's, as Muslims we know she's gone back to her Lord. For a few hours, the sun shone on the flowers laid in the Queen's memory. And then the rain came again towards the end of a day, the first in so many that she is not here. Geraint Vincent, News at 10. Well, we can cross now to Romley, who's outside Buckingham Palace tonight, where so many people have been gathering over the last 24 hours, and they were very warmly surprised to see a visit from their new king, Romley. What's it like down there tonight? Well, as you can see, Julie, people are still here. The crowds have thinned slightly from earlier when you couldn't move in this area. But under the light of the full moon tonight, people are still coming, coming here to pay their respects, to leave their flowers wherever they can. I don't know if you can see the foot of the lion there on Queen Victoria's memorial, but he is knee deep in flowers. I was speaking to a policeman who said that they had expected the crowds would disperse much earlier than this, but in the dark and the damp, if you can see these shots of the Mall, it is closed to traffic, but it is still full of people. And I want to show you over here too, because this is the line of people who have been queuing to file past the gates of Buckingham Palace here. The queue earlier was an hour and a half long and people are stopping to take pictures, to leave their flowers, which are now being threaded, if you can see, through the railings, through the gates there, a growing, living wall of colour. And it was here, right here, that uh, the new king did his walkabout. I was standing here, you could feel the emotional reaction of the crowd to see the king looking really totally shattered by grief, in fact. And I think uh, this outpouring, this outpouring of, of love and respect is really a foretaste of what we are going to see in the coming days when the queen is moved first to Edinburgh then to London, where she will lie in state and people will get a chance to file past her coffin and say goodbye. Romney, thank you. Well, the official royal mourning will last until seven days after the Queen's funeral. Here's what we expect to be happening during that time. Well, tomorrow, King Charles will be officially proclaimed king at an accession council at St James's Palace in London. It'll be broadcast live for the first time. That's at 10am, followed by a public proclamation an hour later. On Sunday, the Queen's coffin is expected to be taken by road to the Palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh. Monday, a procession is expected along the Royal Mile to St Giles Cathedral, where there will be a service likely attended by some members of the royal family. On Tuesday, the Queen's coffin is expected to be flown to London and taken to Buckingham Palace in preparation for her lying in state. That is expected to begin on Wednesday. Following a procession to Westminster Hall, Her Majesty will lie in state for four days. 
Her funeral is expected to take place the following Monday, September the 19th, after which she'll be laid to rest in the King George VI Memorial Chapel at Windsor alongside her husband, Prince Philip. Well, Rebecca is tonight at St James's Palace and the events there, Rebecca, tomorrow we'll see an ancient tradition televised for the first time. What will we see? Well, we'll see the new king formally proclaimed monarch at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning here in an accession council that will be historic for a number of reasons, not least because what happens behind those walls will be televised for the very first time, a rare insight into the privy once private council. There are two stages of this part. First, the accession council will proclaim the sovereign. Then we'll see the new king make a declaration and sign an oath to uphold the Church of Scotland. Earlier, I was lucky enough to see a rehearsal with trumpeters sounding a fanfare from that balcony and I can tell you it promises to be quite a spectacle. The last time anyone saw anything like this was back in 1952 uh, when Queen Elizabeth the second was proclaimed sovereign. Uh, tomorrow, the Garter King of Arms will read the proclamation in public on that balcony. Then we'll hear a verse of the national anthem and there'll be a call for uh, uh, three cheers for His Majesty the King. Then the proclamations will be read out right across the UK. Worth noting, despite all this pomp, this is not the moment that Charles became king. This, that happened immediately after the Queen's death. This dates back to a tradition long before rolling news and social media. This is an opportunity to spread the word that he is our new king. Rebecca, thank you. Well, world leaders who released written tributes to the Queen last night today spoke publicly about her. One of the most elegant came from the French president, Emmanuel Macron. She mastered our language, loved our culture and touched our hearts, he said. To you, she was your queen. To us, she was the Queen. Throughout the day, leaders have continued to visit British embassies and high commissions around the world to offer condolences and to pay respects. In Paris, Emmanuel Macron paid a heartfelt tribute to a Queen who spoke French, loved France and who knew all ten of the French presidents who held office during her reign. To you, she was your queen. To us, she was the queen. To us all, she would be with us forever. We will remember and perpetuate the values she never ceased to embody and promote. The moral fortitude of democracy and freedom. In Commonwealth countries, there have been gestures of solidarity and of emotion. Here in Ottawa, Canadians signed a book of condolences at the Governor General's residence, many still visibly struggling to absorb the news. So you have a real sense of loss this morning? Oh, certainly, without a doubt. Uh, and uh, I guess what I do is my memories of me, of her, will, my, my memories of her, I, I think will always provide me guidance. Could you explain a little bit about why the Queen meant so much to you? Because she was the Queen and because she was so faithful to her duty till the very end. She, I think she really um, admired Canada for all its regions and its diversity. I think if she hadn't been queen, she would have wanted to spend more time here. And in the US, President Biden, reflecting the sense of American mourning, was crystal clear in response to one question he was thrown today. You going to the Queen's funeral, sir? Yes. I don't know what the details are yet, but I will be going. And in the Australian capital, the firing of cannon marked the end of an era. While over some of the most famous landmarks, Australian and Aboriginal flags flew at half-mast. I, I was just shocked. And I know that sounds silly, but it's, it just was a shock. And she, I don't know, it's she surreal. just seemed so amazing and across the Tasman Sea indigenous New Zealanders paid their own respects 
Cities around the world are remembering a woman who was the queen of her realms, but also more than that, a symbol of continuity in places that have known so much tumult. Robert Moore, News at 10. Amazing shot there from Berlin. We can get reaction now from two other Commonwealth countries tonight. Ian Woods is in Antigua and Dan Rivers is in the Australian capital, Canberra. Evening to you both. Uh, Ian, Antigua, clearly a fraction of the size of Canada, but they have the same constitutional status. What have the observations and reactions been there? Well, in many ways, the death of Queen Elizabeth is just as profound here as it is in the UK because Antigua and Barbuda chose to keep her as the monarch even after they went independent in 1981. So here in Britain, of course, here as in Britain, there's an instant transition to a new head of state. King Charles is now the commander in chief of the local defence forces. Justice is now carried out in the name of the king. The prime minister, Gaston Brown, issued a statement which ended with the proclamation, God save the king, and included this tribute. Her Majesty's life personified the simplest of qualities, tolerance and decency. Queen Elizabeth uh, visited uh, Antigua three times during her reign, though the most recent was in 1985. She was also here in 1966 and in her Silver Jubilee year of 1977. Uh, Prince uh, King, King Charles was here five years ago to see the recovery efforts after a hurricane. And the most recent royal tour was by Prince Edward and the Countess of Wessex. Now, during that visit, the Antiguan Prime Minister talked about uh, the need for a republic in the future. It remains to be seen how the death of the monarch will uh, change that timeline and bring it any closer. OK, Ian, thank you for that. And over to Dan now. And, uh, of course, so many royal visits to Australia over the years. The recently elected Prime Minister, though, supports the idea of the country becoming a republic, doesn't he? But clear that now is perhaps not the moment for those sort of politics. Yeah, that's right, Julie. I mean, Anthony Albanese is avowedly Republican. Uh, he has talked in the past about the need for Australia to stand on its own two feet when it comes uh, to a head of state. He even appointed an assistant minister for the Republic uh, on gaining power, a, a crown minister charged with getting rid of the crown, if you like. But I think he will be very cautious at the moment about appearing too opportunistic uh, and about uh, the, the idea that he's in any way exploiting the situation. He's got a very full intray anyway with tackling the cost of living, climate change, giving better representation and voice uh, to Indigenous uh, Australians. And he has said in the past that any talk of a referendum would be for uh, a second Labour term. The focus at the moment is on safe, orderly government, if you like. And uh, although they have a working group looking at a referendum which may report back after a state funeral. I think we're talking about years uh, rather than months uh, before any referendum, mindful as they are that in 1999 the Australian public rejected the idea uh, of going to a republic by 55%. OK, Dan, uh, in Canberra and in Antigua. Lucky Ian. Thank you both gentlemen this evening. Well, across the Commonwealth, the Queen was served by more than 170 prime ministers. Fifteen were from the UK. The first, Sir Winston Churchill, was himself born in 1874. The 15th and final one, Liz Truss, in 1975, more than a century apart. It was typical of the Queen's total devotion to duty, that word again, that her last act as constitutional monarch was an invitation to Miss Truss to form a government. For the previous 14 holders of the office, their weekly meeting meetings, audiences they're called, were very much a two-way conversation. The head of the government offering political updates, the head of state providing a sounding board based on her own personal wisdom and, of course, decades of experience, as they've been telling Tom. She did say, you know, her first prime minister was Winston Churchill and that was before I was born, so it gave me a sense of how long she'd been the monarch even at that stage. When you're Prime Minister, there is that particular relationship between the head of state and head of government. And it's an opportunity, which you don't get in other circumstances, to be able to speak openly about the issues that you're dealing with. Whenever you're with Her Majesty, you always think, you know, she has seen so much and heard so much and had to deal with so many different people that you think probably nothing ever surprises her. I enjoyed hearing her, and I hope that we thought the same things together. Don't forget she's been Queen longer than any of us was ever Prime Minister. It was often she had a who the you were.
Prime Minister, President, Prince, Pauper. She'd met many like you before. Older, grander, richer, wiser, smarter. What was there she had not seen? This indeed was an historic occasion. An historic picture, too. This was, after all, a monarch who began her reign, dealing with Winston Churchill. So imagine being a new prime minister headed for the weekly audience with the monarch. It's probably the greatest privilege of being a prime minister is that you get to see this extraordinary public servant um, up close and spend time with them. You see them for one hour every week while Parliament is sitting. The prime minister, your majesty. It is very formal. You walk into the room and you bow and then you uh, are offered a seat. But it's once you start talking, she has a very good way of putting you at ease and what was going wrong or what was going right. So much clearer and actually you'd come out always more confident because you just spent an hour with one of the greatest public servants of all time. Well, it is an incredible experience and there are many other leaders around the world who find it quite extraordinary that the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom has that weekly audience with Her Majesty the Queen. And it's, uh, I think, the first time I, I went to an audience with Her Majesty, it was um, a sense of huge honour, um, but a bit of trepidation because I wasn't quite sure what it was going to be like. And this is your monarch. Fourteen Prime Ministers in all made the journey to the palace for their weekly hour with the Queen, the 15th never quite getting the chance. They described these meetings as a little like a confession. I suppose she had been the repository over so many years with so many secrets. She knew how to keep a secret, but most important, she knew how to give the Prime Minister a sounding board and a person to listen to to them and talk to them in a way that no other person could. Did you find you were completely honest with her on that basis that you felt, you know, you were able to sort of unburden yourself, really? Yes, I mean, I really did unburden myself on many occasions when things were really difficult, when you're taking either really difficult decisions or maybe you had a huge problem within your cabinet and you were talking about it with her. And I felt I could say anything to her. Um, and, you know, as the relationship grew and as time went on, obviously, you get to know the person, not just her as the monarch, but her as the person. Did you find her a personal support to you? I think it was Wilson who said that it was the only conversation he could have in a week with someone of real substance that he didn't think was going to be leaked or, you know... That's or definitely maybe... true, because there's no-one else in the room. <clears throat> and so you feel you can reveal what you're really thinking about something, the real mm. worries you have about a particular course of action or consequences or problems that you've got or political problems or problems within the cabinet. You know, you felt you could say absolutely anything. So what might one ask was the purpose of it? That is something all her living prime ministers seem incredibly clear on. The one thing that shines through with Her Majesty is the sense of duty that she has put herself, if you like, personal interest to one side in the interests of her country and her sense of duty. I think what is also striking is how respected she is around the world. Um, absolutely, when you meet other world leaders, um, there is huge respect for Her Majesty. So she has shown that role of a woman in that position and earned respect around the world. She had visited over 100 countries. She knew most of these foreign leaders probably better than you did. Mm. And you knew you were listening to someone who really knew mm. what they were talking about. Did you ever feel nervous? I mean, was it a little bit like doing your homework? Like, all right, I've got to make sure that I'm yes. across this because I know she's going to ask me some difficult yeah, questions. You, about you definitely, whatever subject you were going to talk about, you always knew she would have, you know, watched the latest news bulletins. You knew she read everything that went into her box of papers. You knew if it was anything to do with security or defence or the armed forces uh, or overseas affairs, she'd be immensely knowledgeable. If I asked her for um, her view on, on an issue, she would, she would give it carefully, but, but she, would, she would give it. And if I asked her about things that were to do with where the British people might be or what, what she thought was the state of British opinion, you know, she had a very shrewd sense of where where the centre of gravity was. And at the end of it all, there was, of course, in each individual case, a very personal relationship, forged not just in London, but Balmoral too. 
even if you've you know mm. been to Buckingham Palace and you've done audiences with Her Majesty, nothing quite prepares you for being you know in a cottage halfway up a hillside in Scotland um, with uh, the Duke of Edinburgh cooking a barbecue and <laughs> Queen handing around the food. That's mm. something I'm never going to forget. It says everything about her that she worked right until the very end of this, her final summer at Balmoral, her last significant act as monarch to invite her 15th prime minister to form a government. Sometimes when you, you, you would watch the Queen and she would be doing ceremonial duties, she's greeting people, she could be quite shy actually when out in, in, in public. It would be easy to miss the real toughness of character that she had. I mean, she was a very tough person, tough in the best sense. I mean, resolute, strong. She managed to adapt to a world that was so different when she died from when she first became queen. So times, fashions, ideas, people, places even may have changed. Prime Ministers may have come and gone. But the Queen, at least in her devotion to her public role, remained resolutely the same. Above all else, her duty was to be that point of unchanging principle in a changing world. I think she'll be remembered as somebody who was absolutely remarkable. I think it's going to take us a very long time to fully understand just what we've had and just what we've lost. Tom hearing the reflections of three former prime ministers uh, there. Well, let's return to the main events of the day and that walkabout by the new king and his address to the nation this evening. The broadcaster and author Jonathan Dimbleby is here along with Chris. Uh, to you first, Jonathan, these were sort of remarkable scenes, weren't they, uh, before the palace. Here's a man who is still in the turmoil of grief in that first point of contact with his subjects. It was extraordinary. I mean, he's done lots of walkabouts extraordinarily well, but to see that and the look on his face and the warmth and affection and regard, you, you never know with those things, how would it be? And there was no doubting that, the sympathy, the, the love. Love has been a word used by him today and a lot by the public as well. It's, you know, it's not a word we throw about a great deal, but I felt that came through in an immensely powerful way and also in impact. If you look at his role, very important. That, is, that sets uh, in motion an attitude and a relationship which I think will develop an openness, the touching. The Queen, you did not touch. You may have loved, but you didn't touch. He touches, he's kissed on the hand, on the face, and that, I, I'm afraid, he may get an awful lot more kissing than he really wants because it could go on. It could <laughs> so we weren't get, get necessarily quite... anticipating that as a feature of the coming days. <laughs> but it's a style, isn't it? A different, it's a, very it's different a very style. open style. Yeah. And, and, and he, he's able, he can embrace that. He's relaxed and easy enough to do that. Yeah, and in terms of the sort of comms around this, the public perception of this, it would have been very straightforward for very formal meetings. There's so many things on the new monarch's uh, to-do list, effectively, on a day like today. Exactly. He could have arrived at Buckingham Palace uh, in the car as he did after stepping off the plane from Scotland and, and driven straight through the gates and, and into the palace and got on with work and met the Prime Minister and recorded the speech and all the rest of it. He didn't. He chose to meet those people and have those interactions before he and the Queen Consort went through the gates. Of course, the other key moment today was this momentous first address to the nation at six o'clock this evening. I mean, there was so much in it. Uh, let's just take out one section to get an insight into what we listened to earlier. My life will, of course, change as I take up my new responsibilities. It will no longer be possible for me to give so much of my time and energies to the charities and issues for which I care so deeply. But I know this important work will go on in the trusted hands of others. I mean, this was quite a moment, Jonathan, wasn't it? Because he was clearly there to pay tribute to his mother, but this was a marker. It was, it was an extraordinarily powerful and moving speech. I sure, like many others, I found myself gulping, listening and watching it. That part that you've taken out is extremely important. 
he said it before, but he said it there unequivocally, I know the difference in the role between Prince of Wales and being sovereign. He also said, I won't be able to give so much time. That means the charities themselves, the two big charities are all together now, the Foundation and the Prince's Trust, being run very, very well by others. And, and I think, as, um, as Chris has said, it also suggests that he won't have as much time for the big statements that he makes on issues that now everyone happens to think are extremely important. What I think he is likely to do, and I, this is speculation, uh, it's not that I know anything for certain at all. I think that he will continue doing a number of things. I think he will continue with what sounds like a trade union <laughs> organisation convening. He will, he will bring people together. He will want to know and he'll do it. It'll be, you know, it, Government officials will know it's happening. That will happen. And he will use that as a basis for a greater understanding, satisfying his own curiosity and his own judgment. He will, I think, um, very likely be quite forceful sometimes in the one-to-ones that we saw in Tom's thing. He will be very happy to say, I think, um, forgive me saying so, or uh, if you don't mind me saying, are you really sure that fracking is good, for instance, for purpose. Okay. Um, we'll and just, what, oh, OK. So I just need to... Yeah, yeah of course, sorry. Sure, Chris is dying to get in there as well, because, I mean, really, we could talk about this for such a mm. long time. Well, look, but just a concluding... Everyone thing, was mentioned in that speech. Uh, Harry and Meghan, the Prince and Princess of Wales, the, the new ones, uh, his mother, his father, the Queen Consort. It ticked every single box. And I, I think what we were witnessing was he was not only reflecting on history, but he was making history at the very same moment okay. today. Can I say one tiny thing? <laughs> I don't think he will be silent, though, in public. When he knows there's consensus on big issues, he will feel free. With the endorsement and approval of government, because it has to be, he will say things that really matter in public in big fora, but he won't do it that much. That's my belief. It's also my hope. <laughs> well, we shall see uh, what emerges. It was uh, quite a moment, wasn't it, that many will reflect on in the coming days as we see and we all adjust to the new reality of what we've uh, lived through in the last uh, 24 hours or so. Chris and Jonathan, thank you very much indeed for that. Well, the Queen's love affair with Balmoral dated back to her own honeymoon. She and Prince Philip spent part of it there. Over the years, it offered the get-away-from-it-all privacy. Other royal residences did not. But the Queen did not simply hide away there. She liked to be involved in the life of that part of rural Aberdeenshire. She was known to go shopping in the nearby village of Ballater. No wonder then the people who live there are already missing her so much. Nestled amid the forests and glens just beyond Balmoral, the village of Ballata has cherished and been cherished by the royal family for generations. And every summer there was one visitor welcomed above all others, a very familiar face in the local shops. She would pop in and say hello at the time she did come in. We just thought she was our neighbour. When she came into town, the buzz got around, she was in town, maybe doing a bit of shopping. People just left her to get on with it. Now, as the world mourns, this small village remembers with pride its special relationship with the late Queen. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. I met the Queen three weeks ago. We were at Balmoral. I, I knew she looked a bit frail, but to get the shock of the, the news yesterday just floored a whole lot of us. Today, the community is saddened, but this community is, will get together and support the new King when he, when he arrives. Others shared her faith and will seek strength in that. Reverend David Barr has opened the church for the community to mourn. I'm a boy for the East End of Glasgow. I was an ex-Marine in the Marjus's forces, uh, six foot three, and when I came down to ring the church bell 70 times for each year that she reigned, I was up in the tower, crying my eyes out. She'd been a major part of our lives. As elsewhere in the world, this community is reflecting on what Queen Elizabeth brought to them. She was our beacon of hope. She was our steadfast anchor in rough seas. And she was our constant, always with compassion and always with grace. We can't ask for any more than that, not at all. And she gave it happily. Indeed, she did. Emma Murphy, News at 10.
Balata. And finally tonight, many thousands of words have been said and written about the Queen since her death, just as millions were when she was alive. We asked one of our best-loved children's authors, Sir Michael Morpurgo of Warhorse fame, to compose his own tribute to the Queen. We'll leave you with that now from all of us here on News at 10. Good night. We are all sharing a grief today. I wonder if we have, as a people, ever felt more together than we do now. For some, the world will never be the same again. She was constant and enduring, a comfort and a guide. Glorious times and dark days, presenting so much to know could be good and true in us as a people. It was not the glitter and the crown we admired, it was her. We knew her life had not always been happy and glorious. Like all of us, she had to face the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. We witnessed from far her joys and her tragedies. And so she came to reign, not rule. She pledged herself her whole life to serve us, and she has. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. She was not born to it, had not expected it. She had to grow into it to find her own way to do this impossible task. She became to us more than a head on a stamp or a pound coin. She became a familiar, one of the family. In the end, a granny to the nation. We have lost our granny queen. A light in our lives has gone out. The light may have been flickering in recent years, but it glowed still and we are left in darkness, but holding hands, knowing it is up to us now to create a new dawn. There will come a time of hope and reconciliation and harmony. She believed that, lived for that. When our grieving is done, we must do the same. We must keep believing and remember her.